All right, well, I know a bunch of you are looking for a 10K report tutorial. You probably don't have an hour, two hours, three hours to spare to do this. So this tutorial is going to be a little bit different from what's out there. I'm going to do six parts to this and going to break down and really make it digestible so we can look through, show you how to read the annual reports, these 10Ks, show you how to read it, show you a couple basic ratios you can derive from it. And then from there, it will empower you to take that a step further and really get going when it comes to understanding how a company's financials work and understanding what is in there, what the numbers mean, represent all those sorts of great things. So the first video we're going to do here is going to be on EPS growth. And I think it should be obvious why we're examining EPS growth. We're going to start in the income statement. You know, we'll, we'll bounce around between the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement. We'll start in the income statement. Check out EPS growth. I'm going to show you how to find it and then show you a quick little Excel spreadsheet you can make to help you calculate like what that growth is. And then, you know, from there, you can you apply that to your own way of figuring out what growth means for you. It's, it's pretty obvious, right? You look on Wall Street and their number one focus is always growth, 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 earnings, earnings, earnings. So while it's great to know about P.E. ratio, I've definitely covered P.E. ratio plenty of times on my channel. Uh, you know, I'll probably circle back to it and just briefly so you can learn it again if you haven't already. But let's look at EPS growth. I feel like that's not really talked about much. And I think, you know, it will be very useful. And if you can calculate this very quickly, figure out the little things that maybe might trip you up, then from there we can really you know, start to understand what the income statement is telling us. So let's get to it. Obviously, we can see my screen here. I'm going to show you how to find annual reports. Okay, so we got to go to the source, sec.gov. And you're going to have to bear with my Excel skills once I pull up Excel. So company filings is all right here. And let's use, let's say, Apple. It's an easy one. So we put Apple in the search bar. And over here is where you're going to want to put 10K. If I'm going too fast for you, by the way, I have another video um, how to properly analyze a stock. And that's going to show you exactly how to get to this 10K. But real quick, basically hit documents. We're looking at the filing dates here, right? So 2017 in November. Let's check out the documents. Check out 10K. And then from there, okay, we have Apple. Now, when you look at the 10K, hundreds of pages, obviously, a lot of data. There's going to be three statements we want to find, okay? Right here, item eight is going to show your financial statements and supplementary data. And so there's three statements. The income statement or statement of operations. The balance sheet, which is here. Or the cash flow statement, which is here. So they group them all together. Uh, you can see that's how you click down there. They made it easy. If you look at older annual reports, you don't have that option. What I like to do, consolidated is a keyword because that tells you that they have audited the report. And so, you know, you're looking at the official, the numbers that, that are up there. So I like to put consolidated balance sheet and just, you can control F. I don't know if you guys know that little shortcut. It lets you search inside of a web page or Microsoft Word, any of those. And so I like to type in consolidated balance sheet and it'll take me right in the meat, right in the middle of where I need to go and then just either scroll up or down. Because it's tough. Like every, while every company has to file the same annual report, um, they don't all do it exactly the same. So you have to be able to kind of wade in and out. So now that we're at the income statement, let's do something fun. Let's pull up Microsoft Excel. And let's make ourselves a little, you know, I don't want to say a financial model, but let, let's just pull some information, make ourselves a, our own little spreadsheet, and that will show us kind of how to use some of the info in a 10K. So, I don't know, let's make, uh, let's say like net income, shares outstanding, and earnings per share. And then let's say dilute EPS. Okay. 
let's add some dates. And if you can't tell, yes, I use my mouse for Excel. Shoot me. I know it's like a sin. Whatever. Um, it's one thousand dollars. So. EPS, right? That's what that's what we want to talk about. That's what Wall Street's all about. They're always talking about EPS. So, how do we calculate earnings per share? Well, basically, all you have to do is you take the earnings and you you divide it by how many shares there are. In a company's financials, they report that as net income and shares outstanding. So let's take 2017. Let's look at this little income statement. Try to figure out what it all says, right? And my dog is playing with my chair and now his tail's wagging. Knock it off. All right. Net sales. That's going to be your revenue. That's all the money that's coming in, right? And then cost of sales. So in Apple's case, we're talking about the costs to employ the workers that work at Apple Store, the costs to manufacture. That's all going in the cost of sales. How much are they spending on advertising? And then this gross margin, that's going to be right there. It's going to be you know, revenue minus expenses. And it's basically going to be the earnings outside of some of the other stuff that uh, you need to take out. Um, you need to think about taxes. And here we can see like they segmented off operating expenses, uh, operating income. And, you know, these are going to be different depending on the company again, depending on the business, depending on the industry. So what you really, what I really want to highlight for now, just so you understand Net sales, you see how it's the top line. That's what the when you when you hear on CNBC and stuff, or you hear these uh, Wall Street guys, they're always talking about top line growth, top line growth. This is what they're talking about. It's net sales, it's the revenue, and it's everything that comes in before we take out expenses. And then there's net income. You can see how like there's this little section, and it's the bottom line. So it's like, oh, you know, what's the bottom line? That's what they're referring to as well. And it's the net income. So all this stuff in the middle is just like expenses stuff. We don't have to worry too, too much, especially because this is a tutorial. So let's do that. Okay. Net income. These are earnings. And I'm just going to copy what's here into there. So that's 48 through 51, 45, 687, 53, 394. And, you know, you can make a spreadsheet like this at home. <laughs> following along right uh isn't too difficult now we're gonna go to shares outstanding you can see there's two options basic and diluted i actually wrote a blog post about the differences between these and it, you can get really really in depth i'll try to keep it simple again for the sake of brevity and time basically the difference between basic and diluted is diluted is taking into account like stock options right so a lot of companies like to give their employees stock options and the employees can hang on to them for a while or they could execute them, right? And, and use that to, to buy and sell the stock, the company stock. So diluted is going to, it's like a conservative measure. It's going to act as if everybody's already exercised their option to own the stock, which is the true, you know, you, you want to be more conservative than aggressive. And it really is the true, dilution of the company it's really how the ownership's really being split apart is through is when you're looking at diluted shares you know basic shares well yeah sure in the best case nobody's gonna exercise their stock options but the minute they do all of a sudden each share you you hold represents less and less of a percentage of the company that you are owning so why even use it as a calculation? I don't even know why it's there, but you know, it is, I guess I understand, right? Because it's like, maybe it's more of a real time thing. Like these are the people who have actually exercised their shares. And then these are the people who could possibly do it. But anyway, it's always better in my opinion to be more conservative and take that worst case analysis kind of a thing, right? Less chances to be wrong in the future. So now here's another little thing that's if you're a rookie, it might kind of get lost on you. But right here, okay, everything here is in millions. But then when we look at shares, see, in millions except number of shares which are reflected in thousands. So we need to adjust, right? 
when it's reflected in thousands, that's just three decimal places over. So right here, if we just adjust it three decimal places, one, two, three, then that's going to give us the same in millions as the rest of the data. So when we put it into our little spreadsheet I just created, 52, 51, that's not the right box. I am not a wizard on this. That's quite obvious. Okay. And you're going to have to forgive my, okay, whatever. Okay, so now we have net income. We have shares outstanding. What is earnings per share? Again, net income divided by shares outstanding. So take the net income divided by shares outstanding. And we have 921 earnings per share. Now, if we just check here, what does it say? 921. It says the same thing. So we're golden. You know, our little spreadsheet did the right calculation. And you can see that's how you calculate earnings per share. So what's the next important thing, right? We have the earnings per share calculation. We j I just showed you how to use a 10K to figure out earnings per share. The next step is to figure out, okay, how can you quickly and easily calculate earnings per share growth. Well, I'm glad you asked, right? So this comes into more of a, um, I don't know if it's like a math calculation or, or whatever you want to call it, but let's just for, for this, let's look at, so we don't have to, I, I showed you how to calculate this initially. So we don't have to do that in, for the next annual reports we'll pull up. Let's just copy this stuff into here. So 921 for 2017, 831 for 2016, 922 for 2015. And we'll make an EPS growth. So the, I'll show you real quick, just so you can, I guess, know for yourself how to calculate growth. Let's see, this is showing, <laughs> this is showing us how to do an Excel, which is exactly what I'm go about to show you. But I just want to see if I can visualize it for you guys. Yeah, here we go. Present minus past divided by past. That's going to give you your growth rate. And it's expressed in the decimal here, which um, when you move the decimal to play, it's, it's percentages. If you know how to use percentages, uh, a 1 is 100%, percent point five one that's 51%, and so on and so forth. Keep in mind, you know, the stock market, Average stock market has grown, average stock, 10% a year for over 90 years. That's that's It's been very close to around 10% for a very, very long time. So, it, you know, if earnings follows growth, I'm sorry, if, uh, if the share price follows earnings growth, which in theory it should, sometimes it doesn't, and, and you start to talk about the madness of the crowds and, and the different way that people perceive it. But in general, you should really think about, okay, well, if a company can grow its earnings by 10% a year or more, then it should, you know, do quite well in the stock market. And I at least prescribe to that kind of thinking. And, you know, there's a lot of different back tests you can run and all this sorts of things. But I think it's just a good rule of thumb. Let's try to get 10% growth, right? Makes sense. So to, to grab this formula, let's, let's do it in Excel. So the present is going to be 2017's number divided by last year's number. Subtract, I'm sorry, subtract by last year's number, divide by last year's number. And we don't want dollars. We want percentages. There we go. 11% from 2016 to 2017. So Apple had a quite pretty good year. And did they see share price climb from that? Uh, if you remember, this was released November. So if we look, you know, November of 2016, it's about here-ish. So 108 to 2017, 170. 
So we're looking at, I mean, it almost doubled. So obviously the growth for this period way, way, I don't know if you want to say outperformed, but it, it outgrew the EPS growth, which uh, during a bull market, obviously it's one of those indicators that people are really, really optimistic about it. Now, if, you, if you're also familiar with Excel, you can just use this. I'm clicking on the bottom right hand side and you can just drag this over. And now it's going to calculate automatically whenever we put in new data into this column it's going to calculate the growth for us automatically. Nice little shortcut. So you can see from 2016, from 2015 to 2016, instead of growing, it actually declined 10%. And if we look here, I mean, we did see a bit of a decline, right? Uh, Wall Street tends to be pretty recent. They, they're pretty up to the minute when it comes to their, you know, quarterly reports when it comes to analysts uh, reporting on how a company did, putting projections and, and uh, estimates and stuff. And so sometimes, you know, because the quarterly reports come out before the official annual report does, then a lot of times you'll see, for example, whatever, when this comes out, even though the data is brand new, it's, it's kind of been around. People kind of expected it for the past nine to 12 months because of the quarterly reports. It's not how I like to invest. I like to always use annual reports, and I've talked about that many, many times. But it can kind of give us some insight into why maybe the stock price moved in the way it did. So if we look here, 2015, November, you can see that the price had already started to drop, and it continued to drop for almost a year. So that probably... I'm not going to say for a guarantee, there's no such thing as a guarantee on Wall Street, but it probably had to do with the fact they went from 831, I'm sorry, 922 down to 831. You can see EPS growth can be quite useful. And the, the, I want to finish up the video showing you how I like to use EPS growth, and it's something a lot more different than like a, a straight year over year growth, which is what most of Wall Street likes to look at. And I think it's very important as well. So definitely stay tuned to the end of that if you're interested. Um, so we have these three numbers. Let's take it back all the way back 10 years. So I guess this, this does kind of, um, at this time is now when we're gonna talk about how I like to look at growth. Most of Wall Street focuses on year-over-year -year growth, which is fine. You know, that, that's what they do. But when it comes to how a business is really doing, in any business, it doesn't matter, right? Their real ability to continue to create profits, create cash flow, all those sorts of things, just because it's cyclical or, you know, has a bad year here or there doesn't mean that over the long term the company is really in a bad place. So it makes sense in my mind to look at much bigger time frames and allow for these sort of fluctuations. And so instead, you know, if you're, you know, if you're looking at such a short term, right, if you're just looking, if, if you're just looking at what happened from 2015 to 2016, you would think that the business is doing really bad. But the longer and longer you start to look at what a business is really doing then you start to see well yeah any business is going to have growing pains especially during recessions or, or times where the economy is bad but over time great businesses continue to grow cash flow and they continue to be able to do it at a higher and higher rate the bigger and bigger they get and that's what you want to see in an investment so in my mind you should be looking at something greater than one year growth benjamin graham also agrees with me um if you're not familiar with him, <laughs> highly recommend you figure out who that guy is. Figure out what value investing is. Warren Buffett was uh, one of the first to really talk about how Benjamin Graham was huge for his influence and in getting him really to where he is today. Uh, he's considered the father of value investing. Value, there's been a ton of value investors that have just done phenomenally well in the market. So Benjamin Graham likes seven to ten years. He likes he likes to look at least that that much, and I believe I don't know if if he was the one who who said this. He might have 
uh, this is what I like to do, okay? I like to take a three year average. So what that means is I wanna, I wanna look at the average between the past three years. I think that gives us a much better picture of the growth than a year over year like this one was. Now, we don't have that yet because we haven't looked back enough, right? We have the growth from 2016 and 2017. We have from 2015 and 2016, but we don't have from 2014 and 2015. So let's fill the rest of this out and then we'll look at, you know, how is the three-year growth and how would Graham kind of look at this? And I think that that really will really fire you up and, and get you in a really good spot. So if we go back three years, because we already have 17, 16, 15, let's go to 14. And again, control F. Boom, we're right there. Net income again, okay? No, no, no. let's skip that because we don't need to do that. We're just gonna use diluted EPS. 6.45 dollars. All right, and let's do it some more so we can get like at least 10 years. So you can see, I mean, really earnings is the only place where I really look back this far. I like to look back really far um, for companies in a different, for a different reason. Okay, now here's where we see something interesting and maybe where we should have, in fact, did this shares outstanding. You can see there's like a huge difference here, right? Between 27 down to six. What really happened is it looks like they had a stock split here in 2011, okay? To go from basically the way a stock split happened or they went from... So it looks like they actually, um, what did they do? Let's, let's Google it. But look, how I can figure this out, right, is if you look at shares over here, look at that number. So if we do the conversion again, right, yeah, they must have split it. Because now we're at 936. If you want to round, whatever, I can hear the critics round 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 yes be the good math person okay so you can see here right we're at 900 2017 is at 5200 so that's a big difference that means they really diluted their shares and what that's going to do when you when you do a stock split is it's going to change your eps when there's more shares outstanding and the earnings is going to stay the same, so the EPS is going to drop. Which didn't mean anything bad happened for the shareholders necessarily, or even the business, you know. Uh, which, again, this is one reason why <laughs> I wanted this to be a really simple tutorial. But unfortunately, with when it comes to earnings per share EPS, it's not that cut and dry. Because you want to make sure that EPS is is steady and growing but you also want to make sure that uh, net earnings is steady and growing and so if there are going to be changes in the shares outstanding whether whether they dilute <clears throat> with the stock split or they buy back a lot of shares uh, you're gonna you're gonna want to make sure that that the earnings picture is still healthy and it's still growing in, in the way that you would expect so in this case you know in most cases you can just do an EPS kind of um, spreadsheet like we did here but I'm gonna argue now because they played around with the shares so much we really want to look at net income so let's let's fill those numbers in real quick And this is one example of why I'm glad I'm splitting this up into six parts because there's there's just so much that can go on when you're looking at a 10K annual report and 
you know, if, if you can just kind of slice it up and maybe tackle one at a time rather than trying to do it all at once <laughs> and like power through in an hour, I think doing it this way is going to help you retain it a lot better than if you were to try to do a sprint, you know, marathon versus sprint. And I definitely need to apply that in my own life currently. Always remember marathon versus sprint. Stop being so impatient. Okay, so now, now we see, right? Here's the real picture. Remember, there's the stock market, and it's representing the ownership of a business, but it's not what the business is. The business is what's important. That's what's behind what's going on in the stock market. So what we see here is net income, and that's that's really what the company's earning. You can see in 2017 it was at 48 billion, and in 2011 it was at 25 billion. So that's still nice growth. So let's do that as well. Let's calculate that growth. And man, I wish I knew all the shortcuts. I don't even know what that did. Let's do an earnings growth. This is actually, you know, I wanted to show you guys EPS growth, but this is actually how I do growth myself because I understand that a lot of things can happen with the EPS, like exactly like we just saw. Okay. And some people will argue, well, you know, an EPS growth is good for a shareholder because if a company bought back shares, then they do own a higher percentage. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but at the end of the day, it can fluctuate. And what I really care about is what's the business doing. You know, if a, if a company bought back shares, well, great. You know, that helps EPS, but how does that help the business a, a, as a whole? How does that help it in 10 years? How, how does that help the business? Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, how does it help its earning power in 10 years? It doesn't. It's just, it's a way to give you value and that's fine. But at the end of the day, did it really help the underlying business? So now we're starting to see, okay, with the earnings growth, let me color code this to make it a little bit easier. And we're going to do the same thing that I was going to do with EPS. Let's do the same thing for earnings growth. You can see how Excel can be really helpful when it comes to reading the 10K. And you don't need somebody else's spreadsheet. You can make your own and you know start to really figure out a lot of great stuff. And that's what I'm hoping that the, this six part tutorial series will help you to do it will empower you and you can do further research as, as you grow as an investor and be able to calculate your own metrics using Excel and because of this tutorial you'll be able to know how to find everything right so back to EPS growth earnings growth we have you can see how much this fluctuates right for the earnings Went five, negative 14, 35. It's really hard to get a good like, picture of how the business is doing. When you smooth it out over three years, now it's nice to see. Well, okay, the past three years, it's grown around nine. It's very close to that 10% average that we like to see. Same with these three, these three, you know. So we, we can start to see a long-term chart, right? It, it starts to look more like this long-term chart rather than this short-term chart, right? Where it's so choppy, you, you can't even tell what's going on with the business. That's why you want to look over the big picture. And you can see, you know, growth was crazy good back in, in, in the good years, 2014 and previously. And I think there's no surprise that the stock kind of really uh, reacted to that. I want to go one more. Um, we, I did forget to add shares outstanding. So 
let's add that in here 2014 so you can see it looks like they they went through multiple splits not necessarily okay not necessarily but um it looks like they they did a split here because this is where it's the highest and then they're slowly buying back shares so that's why if you look here you see this negative because of the stock split that's going to screw up all of our averages because in reality it's more like this where they're buying back shares see how the shares are decreasing as you go right to left so while earnings while earnings is is doing kind of doing this thing the share buybacks are making eps growth higher than the actual earnings growth i think i think this is the best kind of place to see that That's definitely, yeah, that totally makes sense. So they must have really bought back a lot of shares in this in this time. And I'm going to double check that right now. See how this control F is super helpful as you're going through the years. So again, let's look at the shares. Yeah, and you indeed you do see You see just a constant trend of buying back shares, which I have no problem with that. You know, if they're going to pay a dividend in addition to buying back shares and if, if the shares are undervalued, I think it's a fantastic way to return capital to shareholders. But it's important to keep in mind when you're doing these analyses and you're looking at EPS growth to also look at the total earnings growth picture and understand, OK, there's a lot of share buyback here. How do we know? Well, the company grew this much from the 8 to 10% range for the past, let's say, five years because this one's looking at this growth. So you can say we're looking all the way back five years. So while this is close to 8 to 10, this is 15 to 16. So we're seeing a higher Wall Street quote growth rather than a real business growth because they bought back shares. And how were we able to identify that? Looking here, it was really hard. <laughs> I don't know. You would not be able to deduce that from looking here at all. But by doing a couple of quick ratios, quick calculations, I mean, what, this take like a couple minutes to get this data? Then we can see, and then oh, it becomes obvious, well, they've been buying back shares that much. So, I mean, you can choose, right? You can follow the company for six years and listen to every little report that comes out and be like, oh, well, they just reported their bought, they bought back shares. They just reported they bought back shares. Great, fantastic. Or you can look at an annual report, learn to read the 10K, learn how to analyze that stuff, and you can make that determination for yourself like we did here. Now, I want to finish off this example and basically I want to tell you about the way that Benjamin Graham really said to go back to Graham. He said he wants to look at 7 to 10 years uh, of earnings growth. And I believe he said he wants the three-year average growth and then that difference from 10 years. So so what that means is, you know, if, if you're looking at 10-year growth, that would be, that would just simply be taking this 2017 uh, to 2018, right? That would be 10 years. But when he says the three-year average growth from 10 years, that means, well, what did it do? You know, this is looking at this, remember, which is looking all the way back to 2013. So really, it's like, well, what did it do in the past five years compared to what did it do in the last five years here? So then that's really going back quite far. So we're here in the 20, 2009. Let's finish up this spreadsheet. I think I went too far. Sometimes you'll see the numbers change too um, as they do adjustments. So be cognizant of that when you're looking in the past.
I like to type numbers in as they were reported. So this was 2009. Now we know that was like the most, um, the most recent. All right, so can we get our little seven year? Yes, we can. So the, the Benjamin Graham calculation, let's do that. And it's going to be quite simple. The moment we've all been waiting for. Okay. <laughs> I love blue. Okay, so let's take the, the difference. So if you're following along, and I, I realize it is a little bit complicated, but he wants seven to 10 years. So we're just gonna do seven years for now. And what, so what we're gonna do, you know, a seven year growth would be taken from 2017 to 2010. But we are um, wanting three years because that's what Graham wants. So instead of taking just the net income, we're gonna take the three year average. All right, buddy, we heard you. He wants to be in, in the YouTube video. No, I'm sorry, no, that that's wrong. Okay, so I misspoke, but this is going to give us seven-year growth. You see what I did? So you, you take, and by the way, average per year is different than compounded annual growth, which is CAGR. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, but for the, f for the sake of an example, let's just you're taking the difference. Remember, remember the equation. Present minus past divided by past. So the present is 2017 minus the past back in 2010. That's That gave us, what was it, 200 and something, 235. But that's not per year. We, we want the average per year. So if we went through seven years, then you're going to divide it by seven. So Apple had 35% growth per year over seven years. Now that was obviously really boistered by the fact that you know they had huge growth here 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 so it was really I mean you can see from there to there we're talking about like almost a triple and then there to there almost doubles and then just really keeps some nice momentum. So, you know, I, I think it's safe to say Graham would probably uh, approve of this from the long-term growth perspective. Uh, so the whole three-year thing, I just want to clear that up because I don't want to leave giving you misinformation. The way he did it was he would, again, you would take the three-year average, but instead of doing it like this with, with three-year average growth, he would take the average of these three years of earnings and then the average of these three years of earnings. So you're averaging that, right? You're averaging this number and taking that number, averaging that number, taking that number, and then doing the same calculation we just did here. That's how he's taking it that next step further. Again, for the same kinds of concepts, same reasons. Get more consistent, flatten out the data, and, and try to keep cognizant of like anomalies or, or things that are really going to throw off the calculations. And that's how I wanted to end this video is I wanted to warn you when you're looking at growth and this is going to be whether it's EPS growth, whether it's straight up earnings growth, you want to be careful of anomalies. You want to be careful of things that are going to throw you off. So to give you an example of that, let's say that we had a year of negative earnings here. Now what that does, you can see, <laughs> see how it just throws everything off? 
see that, I mean, makes no sense at all because from 2014 to 2015, they lost money. That's what the parentheses means. And they actually went from, let's say they went from losing money to now gaining $53 billion a year. That's that's a lot of growth. That's not negative growth. They didn't lose. They, they, they increased their size. But the way that this growth formula works is that if you have a negative number here, it's going to throw off your calculation. So you can't even really use this on any negative years of earnings. So keep that in mind. The spreadsheet I use, I call it the, the value trap indicator. Uh, you, you'll hear it mentioned lots of times if you go through any of my YouTube videos, any of my tutorials. It already takes into consideration anything with negative earnings and does not calculate growth based on those because it, because I, I programmed it because I know that any negative earnings is going to throw it off. Keep that in mind. The next thing to keep in mind is... Let's say there's one year where, where the earnings are just really, really low. Or like in this example, you know, what if this one had like a hundred billion? All of a sudden, you know, this this is kinda now this number's off. But you know, what really happened is you know, if you take the average of this I think that gives you a better, maybe it's a bad example because it's never going to be like that crazy, but you, you that's why you want to use like three-year averages. So let's say, you know, let's say this was like 50. So the Graham formula is going to tell us, well, it didn't really grow. Whereas this, actually it did grow, right? Because uh, if you even, if you average this out and kind of even it over three years, you'll see that you know, everything else was kind of steady. And then they had, let's say, a great year, and then they had a hiccup, and then they kind of just went along. Let's just put this back so the numbers look normal. So that's something you're going to want to keep in mind, right? The initial point that you use and on any growth calculation can really throw it off. And so if one year is an outlier, whether that's good or bad, you're going to want to be conservative and use use a good average that really represents what the time period was that you're trying to look for. So if we're looking for like a seven year growth, that's trying to tell us, did the business grow over the long term? I mean, I guess you can argue in a way that it didn't because it was able to, to create $50 billion of profit at, at a time, but you know, was never able to, to, to get above that like here, or you could argue, well, you know, maybe, the company got like some sort of tax settlement, for example, that really gave them a one time sum of all this money. And so then you can argue, well, yeah, you know, this, the, the, the business was really only earning around three, four, five thousand. And so if, if we don't consider this outlier or if we take an, an average that smooths it out more, then we say, yeah, you know, it really did kind of grow over the long term. So that's something to keep in mind, too, when you're looking at growth. It's not going to be perfect. You have to look for outliers. You have to look for things that are going to screw up your growth calculations. But in general, you can get great pictures of what's going on with the business by using simple 10K, simple income statement, making a simple spreadsheet, and being smart about it using averages like, like we did today. And it can really, really help you figure out what's going on with the business, if it's if it's getting better, if it's getting worse. And that can give you an edge over Wall Street. I, I really, really believe that. So three options for you to go from here. Okay, number one, subscribe to the channel. Click on the bell to get notifications. Number two, subscribe to the email list over at stockmarketpdf.com. Get a free ebook. You'll get daily tips. And... Option number three, check out the playlist I created on the channel called How to Analyze a Stock with Valuations. It's a very, very helpful resource. Obviously, you know, I'm going to be continuing this series as well. So it's going to be every Saturday, going to upload a new video that's going to be part of this 10K report uh, tutorial series. So stay tuned for that. And remember, stop working for money. Put money to work for you. Talk to you next time.